I'm Kier. I'm Haley. And I'm Jay from Gallifrey Public Radio. A podcast member of the Gunna Geek Network. Just like the one you're listening to right now. The opinions expressed are those of each individual. Check out all the other podcasts at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. And get ready, because geekiness begins in three, two, one. Get ready for episode number 128 of Better Podcasting. Today, we confront challenging podcast conditions. In this week's Better Podcasting download, we oogle over the recent Google information. Or not. In this week's Better Podback, we consider new hobbies with our podcasting friends. Finally, I'll give my thoughts after a while of using the Heil PR781, Lauren, Avengers Assemble, and happy belated birthday, by the way. Welcome to Better Podcasting, a show where we talk about podcast tips, tools, and best practices to help you succeed with your podcast. What makes us different? Well, just like you, we podcast purely out of the love and fun of it. Podcasting is our hobby, and we recognize that it's yours too. We always encourage your questions and feedback, and you can find all of our contact information at betterpodcasting.com. Here's your host for the show, Stephen John Drew and Stargate Pioneer. Welcome to episode number 128 of Better Podcasting. I am Stephen John Drew, and with me, of course, is my Latin lover, Stargate Pioneer. We need to do the samba together. And uh, oh, by the way, my drone still flies faster than your drone. It's true. Welcome to Better Podcasting, episode number 128. As I said before, we're going to have a lot of great things for you this week. And to start it off, we're going to ask you to give us your How I Saved My Podcast story. This is something that we ask all of our listeners to send in if they are producing a show and they have done something to save an episode or save your entire show. We want to share with the class and we want to give you the recognition for doing a great job and we want to promote your podcast. So get all that information to, into us. You can tweet us at BetterPod. You can get Stephen on our Facebook page, Better Podcasting over there. Or more importantly, you can send us a link with audio or video to podcast at betterpodcasting.com. And just tell us how have you saved your podcast. Oh, by the way, if you have had something go terribly wrong, feel free to head on over to the podcastforum.com and ask for some advice there. There's lots of great minds over there and you can uh, ask and pick their brain. But let's go ahead and talk about picking your own brain in less than ideal conditions. All right, here on Better Podcasting, we've often tried to steer you in the right direction. We've told you before about how there's sort of different sorts of considerations you have when starting your recording. We've talked a little bit about how to streamline that editing flow. And we even talked about ways to monitor your podcast. We, we love some good studio studio can monitor earphone things. Uh, but what happens when all... Well, isn't that a thing? Earphone things? Studio monitoring headphones is the correct mm. pronunciation, Mr. Canadian. Pretty sure it says earphone things in the category. But yeah, what happens when all of this goes wrong? What happens when you find yourself working in a less than ideal situation? Today, we want to talk about how you can handle some of these and make your life just a little bit easier, hopefully. Yeah, I like making my life a little bit easier and we're going to start by talking about recording. So what ideally you'd find yourself in a quiet space with little room echo or no reverb and away from surrounding noise, you know, like your neighbor who's mowing their lawn or driving their motorcycle, actually revving their motorcycle because <laughs> they're driving their motorcycle, it's going away. But if they're revving it, then it's staying right there and annoying you while you're recording. The reality is this doesn't always happen. So how can you work in these less than ideal situations? Let's start with one of our favorite topics, apparently, here on Better Podcasting, the microphone. So make sure you pick a microphone that works best for your conditions. And here's some shocking news for you. It may not always be the Audio-Technica ATR2100 or the Audio-Technica AT2005. And for you audio listeners, I wish you would have seen Steven's reaction to that. For me to say that, that's pretty shocking. <laughs> 
I'm pretty shocked about <laughs> I said it too. So why we generally recommend going with those microphones because A, they're a dynamic cardioid microphone, which helps limit outside noise. And they also have a USB capability. The reality is that there are better microphones for noise reduction. For example, the Sennheiser MD46 microphone, which we've spoken about before, it's designed to be an interview style microphone that has a super cardioid pattern on it, and it's developed to get the speaker's voice in noisy scenarios. So it does have a, that's what I was referring to before, a super cardioid pickup. Pick up. It has a very narrow vocal pickup right in front of the microphone. So if you find yourself in a situation where you've got a lot of surrounding noise or even just the occasional noise like a train, this might be a better microphone for you. Yeah, I got to say that uh, I hadn't heard about this microphone till SP introduced it to me years ago. And um, I don't know how you came across it, but I remember early on, you're like, hey, I found this. This looks pretty cool. And and then you put it to use. It is amazing how well this does at narrowing in on the speaker's voice. Uh, you use this successfully in a few different situations, one of which was at the Gen Con panels last year. Uh, you were able to do some very awesome pickup. But the, m one of my favorite stories actually is recent when one of your co-hosts on a couple of your other shows started to use this and uh, she's got a train, right? Yeah, she does. She lives right next to some train tracks and she is on both Starling Tribune and Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. now. And we were constantly having to divert from her while she was talking while there was a train there. So if she started talking and there was a train, we would let her finish. But then we would like cut her off and not let her talk because there's just no way to noise gate that out. If you're talking while you're quiet, you can pull it out. But while you're talking, it's going to show up in the audio. So the basically if you're trying not to annoy your listener of hearing nothing hearing the train while you're talking and then hearing nothing and then hearing the train while you're talking and then hearing nothing you want to get some continual sound in there so yes the sennheiser md46 was a major portion not the entire bit but a major portion of the capability to take out that noise we also used a hardware solution in the dbx 286s which allotted for a noise gate and allowed for the high pass 80 hertz filter to be used. And the train is a lot of no low noise. Well, the combination of the two were just golden. And I can tell you at the Gen Con panel, there was a train like right next to the hotel as well. And you cannot hear that in the panel. And we did not have a hardware noise gate in there either. So the Sennheiser MD46 is a great microphone to use. Grammar Girl's been using it for probably over a decade. It is a great microphone. And if you are in a noisy environment, you can use it. The only problem is you have to keep your mouth right on the microphone. Absolutely. Now, the microphone itself is not the only thing that you can do to help your recording in these difficult situations. There are some other things that you might want to pay attention to, like how to use the microphone for example, while you may not usually get all close up on your microphone for fear of breathing noises or other situations, uh, in, in a case like this, where you've got a lot of background reverb or, you know, noise, you kind of got to pick what is the best of the worst. And in that situation, it might be a little bit better to get up onto your microphone a little bit closer, turn down your gain so that it is picking up less stuff, and then just really work that microphone. Now, yes, you're going to end up getting some added plosives, but again, you're looking at the best of the worst situation, and uh, you just maybe get yourself an extra pop filter. So a situation like this might be a good time to really check your microphone technique and whether it's working for where you're at. It's one of the reasons why I like the Electro Voice RE320 is its proximity effect is actually minimal. So you can get right onto it and your tone will be the same as if you're six inches off of it. So it is all into the tools of the trade, but what you have is your best tool that you have to record your podcast right now. So you got to learn to use what you have to your best. So what other recording issues might you have besides the microphone? What if you find yourself in a situation where you don't have easy access to your computer, your laptop, or wherever you usually keep your show notes? Dig out that cell phone. Yep, yep, yep. There's always either a link to 
the app that you are using to store your show notes, or maybe you're creating them on the fly. So you might want to use that notepad on there and you don't have access to internet because sometimes it's true when you're on the road and you're recording, talk about Jason Bryant and all his tribulations of world travel. So yeah, dig out your phone and you can follow along with your phone. True story. The first podcast that I ever recorded way back in December of 2010, I used my iPhone 4S to look up show notes. Yep, this baby. And guess what? My eyes were a little bit better back then, but this <laughs> screen is tiny. So I was like looking at it really up close. We weren't doing video then. We we're all in the same room. But yeah, I was looking at it just like this. Whereas my co-host had one of the brand new iPads back then. He was like back up in his chair and just looking at him like, ah, I'm so jealous. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned on there making notes on your phone. Sometimes it's not the best situation to be able to do that either. Like maybe you're in a situation that you're having to hold a microphone in one hand and it's just the, the way that you're at. Um, and so maybe typing on electronically is not the best thing in the world. Well, think about this. Have you considered, and this, this is a new piece of technology, uh, it is a pen and paper this if you fun fact go look back on any of the video shows from when i was on the road last year and generally speaking uh you'll see me writing with an actual physical pen and paper and because in the situation i was in it wasn't ideal for me to make notes electronically it was a lot easier it was a lot more convenient for me in that situation to use pen and paper so just look at the tools that are in front of you that might be a little outside of your comfort but uh it might work things out a little bit better for you so true story in this digital age, while I've been traveling, I've been having a difficulty actually finding said pen and paper in the hotel room. So sometimes you got to bring it yourself or you can be creative, use a tissue, use a tissue box, or maybe just write it on the back of that TV that's right in front of you. You know, whatever works. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I am not condoning the graffiti at all on hotel items, by the way. Yeah. We know what SP does in his rooms. <laughs> no, you don't want to know. Ah, I sleep and I snore. You also might be looking into a situation where you can't carry all of your usual recording gear with you. So maybe you usually have an audio interface with your computer, but you just won't be able to take that on the road with you. Well, we'll suggest investing in a basic handheld audio recorder if you can afford it. So ideally, you're looking at something like the Zoom H4n Pro, a Zoom H5 a Zoom H6, or even one of the sound device Mix Pre uh, 6 or 3s, but you can also look into recording straight into your phone. So with Android, you can always get a USB adapter to go USB into whatever connection, micro, mini, or uh, what, what's the new one, the USB-C connection or whatever, into your phone. Which is, by the way, USB-C as opposed to USB Land or, or USB Air. Uh, well, what if you're in a plane? Oh, well, that's true. I never thought about, well, if you're using a Samsung phone, your plane's probably just going to go down because it's going to catch fire, but continue. Uh, and then we need to discuss the definition between slander and libel there. But in the meantime, yes, you can use a, an adapter cord to go from one of those microphones that has USB into your phone. And you could do the same thing with an iOS device with your lightning to USB connector, which is, I believe, technically called the camera connection kit. You could also look into something like an iRig, iRig Pre or an iRig Pro, or maybe you do have access to your laptop. You can always just use the USB on your laptop with your AT2005, your ATR2100, or your Samsung Q2U straight into your computer. However, we will caution you, be cautious of potential crashing issues, either with the hardware in the computer or the software in the computer. We've seen it before with Cast, with Zencaster with a bunch of different things. So if you're relying on your travel laptop to record your podcast, that is skating on thin ice indeed. It is. Uh, but 
Recording isn't the only place that you might find yourself working in less than ideal situations. For example, what about editing? Uh, we here at Better Podcasting both have had a chance to edit on the road in the last year to two. And even if you're using a good computer, uh, be honest, it's a pain in the butt to, to do. You're outside of your element. You're working with resources that you're not used to. And so it can be really, really tough, especially if you're like us, where we have dual monitors at home and on the road you generally you just have like a laptop so let's start off with the first thing that we recommend if you can use a real mouse of some form okay this is going to save you tons of headache over that trackpad or that little uh touch ball thing you know whatever it is you try to use a real mouse to edit your show it will save you a ton of headache True story, I actually bought the exact same mouse for my travel laptop that I use with my actual computer. It is a different mouse. It's always in my travel go bag, so I don't ever have to remember to take the USB uh, radio RF connection, whatever that <laughs> is, with me. So, yeah, it's ready to go in the bag, and I'm used to it, so it works just great. So another thing is to preload the software that you're using on your travel device. So we're always conscious of licensing here on better podcasting but if your licensing for the software package allows it we do recommend to have the same editing software that's on your home computer on your travel computer and also i do recognize that a lot of people just have their laptop and that's what they do all of their editing on so you're good to go there but what you might forget is that usb external drive that you have with your computer or your laptop and you're like hey, i don't need that and yet all the actual format files, the intro music, the outro music, or any video injections that you want to do for your YouTube video, that might be on that external drive that's left at your house and not in your bag with you. So that can be a little frustrating as well. And I know a lot of people get around that by putting those files on a shared folder, but that still depends on Wi-Fi connection and actually being able to download that and say you're just going camping out in the woods or on a long boat trip You're not gonna have access to that Wi-Fi while you're there or the ability to pull down large files in the air Even if it does have Wi-Fi access true now the one thing you should look at is all of the tools that are available to you Let's use the hotel example because it's a nice go-to example. Have you considered Heading down to that dollar store that's a few blocks away, maybe it's even 10 blocks away, and picking up an HDMI cable so that you can utilize that TV you've got sitting right there as a second monitor or even as a, a primary monitor. It can be amazingly more comfortable to edit on a large TV than it is if you've got like a 14 inch laptop. So that's just a consideration. Look at what's in the space that you're in and can you use that? So that's what it's for. You're not supposed to actually write notes on it. You're supposed to use it as a second monitor. Oh, Steven, you should have told me that before. You know what? It was just funnier seeing you pay the damage at every hotel that you checked into. <laughs> Those damage fees are quite extensive, by the way. Or here's another way to do it. Maybe you just need to phone a friend and call in a favor. Let's say, for example, that you know that you're going to a convention and that you're going to have limited time where you're there. Perhaps your podcast buddy or your co-host that's back home can help you edit that week so you can get it out in a timely fashion. But maybe they aren't even fully doing the editing, but they're just treating your tracks. Like I know in Audacity, if that is your workflow, all of the pre-processing, the EQ or any VST plugins, you actually have to do that beforehand because it's a destructive editor versus some of the more professional style editors where it's a non-destructive editor and that all happens when you actually render. So maybe they can just treat the tracks and that will save you a lot of time because Steven, even using a post rendering situation, you're talking about an hour or so to treat all the tracks. So if you could take care of that ahead of time and give it to your co-host they can whip bang them out in a lot less time all right but we talked a little bit about recording and editing what about working in a less than ideal situation when you're ready to publish your show we've talked about it before all of the steps that is actually involved with publishing your show whether it's publishing and promoting all all of you know actually uploading the information and making sure that you distribute it everywhere it can be a lot of work but maybe you just find yourself in a situation where you have that really slow internet and this is going to take you all night 
to upload your mp3 to your file well let's go and say right away break your routine okay don't get stuck in your comfort zone and be okay with breaking your routine uh, we've talked a little bit before about how it's good to have a flow or a routine with your podcasting, but if that's centered around your ideal conditions, then you got to be comfortable enough to know when that's not going to work for you. So if you are in that situation where something's taking forever to upload, well, perhaps we should look at instead of uploading first and then updating all of the information, maybe we should get the upload going and at the same time use a notepad window, use a, a Word document, use something else to at the same time get all of your notes prepared so that once it is uploaded you can copy and paste so just look and at your flow your workflow and think can i can i do this in a little bit better situation you could also accept the situation and just be okay to come back to things so let's say for example you used to publishing with time codes in all the areas of your show in the show notes however you're on the road and you only have a short time to actually work on your show before you upload it wouldn't it be better just to publish the show and put a note on it, say show notes or time codes coming rather later rather than holding off release until you get back a couple of days later? I think in a lot of cases with timely content, I think that would be good. Also, make sure you utilize the resources that are easily available for you. For example, perhaps now might actually be the time to use that feature on your media host that automatically generates the ID3 information. And if you have a co-host, maybe they can take the lead on typing out some of that information for the show. It's also a good idea to prepare some templates that you can use when you're ready. For example, if you're going on a trip and you might want to pre-type some social media tweets that you can modify, copy and paste later. I know that's a big part of my post-show prep before I publish. I have to write show notes and oftentimes actually I li re-listen to the entire show trying to get all of that encompassed into the tweet or even the iTunes 500 character blurb. And if you can pre-coordinate some of that ahead of time, whip, bang, copy, paste, it's good to go. Finally, you might just want to accept the fact that you won't be up to your usual publishing standard. Yeah, you might find that your show notes are a little less detailed or you can't post everywhere that you normally would. That's okay if it's just a one-off. Don't feel bad. And remember, you can always come back to it late later. And I want to say, I remember a specific example of this Gallifrey public radio, which is the doctor who podcast on the network very early on in their inclusion in the network. They went to a convention, which I don't think is running anymore. It's called long Island who, or uh, L I who they went there and they actually interviewed some doctors and stuff like that. Cause there was a couple of, of the characters, the actors that played the doctor there. And all they had was their zoom H five recording. And instead of actually waiting for that to get back to their house, they did a short episode between the three hosts that were all there. And then they just used one of those camera connection kits, plugged that SD card into their iPhone, uploaded the MP3 file or the, uh, yeah, it was the MP3 file from the SD card all the way up to their media hosting and they published the episode that way. It was just a cut and dry right there on the recorder. And yeah, if you're in a situation like that and you just want to get a, a quickie out or an update for your fans, that can work. So once again, that was Gallifrey Public Radio. I can't remember what episode it was, but we'll dig that out and we'll pull it in the show notes for you. Absolutely. But yeah, that's some great information there, especially that last piece there, SP, where you were saying that uh, you just sometimes need to be okay with with uh, accepting that it's not your usual routine. And that kind of applies with everything that we talked about. It doesn't matter what it is. Just accept you're not working in ideal conditions. So, so it is what it is. Indeed. So if you have any suggestions on how you would deal or have dealt with working in less than ideal conditions to record and publish your show, please go ahead and contact us at BetterPod at Twitter. Over on Facebook, you can get a hold of Stephen Better Podcasting, or you can email us at podcast at betterpodcasting.com and tell us your story, and we'll talk about it in our next show. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and talk about Google before we talk about the PR7A1. Welcome to this week's Better Podcasting Download.
All right, a little inside baseball here. This is a, a fun, interesting week that we've had surrounding this download. Um, you may have heard that there was a five-part article series that came out and it was all about Google's podcast strategy. And originally we had planned to wait until sort of we were able to digest all of this information because the last part actually came out today, the day we're recording this on Friday, April 27th. So we wanted to sort of see what happened with the industry, but things just picked up very, very quickly. And so we said, yeah, let's just go ahead and get to it and talk a little bit about it. Now, one of the reasons why this article that came out, which you can find, by the way, at geeks.link slash Google Podcasts one, that'll take you to the first article. So that's geeks.link slash Google Podcasts one will take you to the Pacific content article. Well, it's because there were several interview quotes from the Google Podcasts project manager, Zach Renault Widen, Wadeen. Wadeen, I believe it is. Wadeen. We talked about this before, Steve. I, I know it's we Wadeen. did. I know we did. Uh, so it's interesting because there's a bit of insight to from an actual Google official on what might be happening in the world of Google and podcasts. Now, the article talks about some expectations with the future of podcasting and alludes to the long rumored native Google podcast app, but never actually confirms that. So we'll caution you there. There is no indication of that concrete. It just alludes to it in the part one. Uh, I searched for it everywhere in my iOS app store and I couldn't find it. <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure that that's the way it's going to be forever. But one of the er the key areas that came out all of all of this was the potential change within the way that Google is searching things. So we're going to go ahead and run down uh, at some of the highlights from some of these five parts. But honestly, it's worth a read. Head on over to that link and you can see all five parts linked at the top. It's worth a read. But... Uh, the big takeaway that came out from part one of this was that Google is now displaying in line in search results an actual podcast. That's right. If you are not familiar with this, if you head on over to Google search app 6.5, I believe it is, or greater on your Android phone, you can actually see in line in search results some Google podcast capabilities where it'll show episodes and you'll be able to actually hit play and subscribe and all of these things. Now, you might be saying to yourself, Steven and SP, this sounds so familiar, almost like you talked about it way back in episode 72 of in March of 2017. Yeah, you'd be right on that because this feature's actually been around for a while. And that's one of the big takeaways that we had here with these, these articles was that there is some information presented in here that comes off as new, but isn't really new, right, SP? Well, true. So I agree that it's not new and we've been talking about it for about a year and long term listeners of better podcasting would know about it. But if you're coming out with a strategy, it's OK to rehash some old stuff. The problem is this article did actually portray it as something that was new and it it's not. It's been around for a while, so it's not new. However, if you didn't know about it, this capability is there and there is a way to take advantage of it on your podcast. If you're self-hosting and if you're already hosting with a media host, I think most of the media hosts have are actually already implemented this. So you're good there. Can I can I take a tangent down that for a moment there? Go ahead. OK, I down it. This was a little bit of a um a, a situation that rubbed me the wrong way. Uh, when this came out, this article came out, there were some voices in the podcasting world that seemed to allude to the fact that the Google strategy that was being discussed in part one here uh, it basically said that those that had their website on their own dot com or the podcast on their own dot com would benefit versus somebody who was using a media host. Now, I've said before, I personally really like self hosting your RSS feeds. I think that the pros of that slightly outweigh the cons. That's my personal opinion. With that said, I was like, what? There is no indication of this. And if you head on over to the actual Google criteria of how you implement this feature so that those who are using Google search app 6.5 or greater, uh, can see this, it's just one line of code that has to go onto an actual homepage. 
homepage, not a .com. So if you've got a page that's set up, you know, your nice little Libsyn page there or your nice Podbean page, and it has this code in there and it meets the requirements, it's going to interact with this indexing properly. So I wrote a whole article about it. If you want to go ahead and check that out, you can. It's geeks.link slash Google RSS feeds. That's uh, geeks.link slash Google RSS feeds. And I just broke down why anybody who's saying that this indicates a favor towards owning your own website on your own .com or having your RSS on there, how it's just not really true information. There's other things that you might want to consider with that, but as far as this feature goes, uh, it seems to work just fine with those who are using media hosts. So I just had to write that article and, and break it down for those people who might be curious about that because it's being discussed. And so, uh, yeah, okay, there was my rant, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. It's an important part because if somebody hasn't heard about this before and they've started the podcast in the last year and they have not implemented the code on their own web hosting, then they should go ahead and go to the Google developer notes and insert that coding to make sure that they're including in the Google search, which is different, by the way, we haven't said it yet on this podcast, than Google Play Music. But if you are hosting with, say, Podbean or Libsyn, you're already taken care of because that is in those podcast pages that they give you. Now, moving on, though, we will say that one of the more intriguing points is the apparent confirmation that the podcast team is working on a Google Assistant integration. Yeah. For those not familiar, Google Assistant is that artificial intelligence that you get on Google phones and also. Wait for it. Google Homes, you know, the devices that are like the Amazon Echo devices. Yeah. This is very interesting because it presents an alternative method than Amazon has been uh, interacting. And Amazon has been largely been dependent on third party skills like TuneIn, for example, to handle podcasts. While it looks like Google may be looking at native support, I think Amazon eventually is looking at native support, but I actually haven't seen anything out in the open about that either. So Google the home devices, they will have integration with the Google Assistant, which will interact with this Google mobile search, which you cannot get the results, by the way, from like a Chrome browser on your PC or any browser on your PC. It has to be an Android mobile device. And it has to be Google search 6.5 or higher. Now, why I say that is because those of you who are using Google Chrome on your Android won't see these results. So if you've ever took a look at um, uh, the way that an Android device works, a lot of times you'll see widgets on there. Well, those widgets are actually tied to that Google search app. It's a different feature. And so that is why that works if you search that way. But when you search Chrome, it's a whole different browser. So, yeah, that's definitely something that's important to know. And um, while we're talking about it, that's a great indication on some of the ways that this information isn't totally new because for for the last year, the guidelines have said that they've been hoping to get Google Chrome on Android integration. And it said that for the last year that they're hoping to get it soon. So um, obviously, there's still a little bit of development to happen with this feature. And remember, this article is based on an interview with Google's podcast manager. It is not a Google wide strategy. Although I would hope that it would be linked into a total and complete Google wide strategy. This article doesn't indicate that this is a part of a huge Google interactive uh, strategy or anything else for that matter. So it is something that you need to keep your eyes on as it develops because Google does have a lot of Android devices and those Android devices are primed for people that have not been able to consume podcasts for whatever reason is, you know, it's just not native in their architecture. They're just going about it a different way than iOS has over an Apple because iOS has had a specific app or a program in iTunes to actually contain the podcast, just like they do music. Android's never really had that. I mean, they've had it with Google play music, but it was impossible to use. So if you can integrate it with the actual a search device that's already available there and subscribe with a put a widget on your home screen i believe is that what it's called a widget or is it a shortcut let's well the widget i don't know what the technical terms are let's go with yes okay since i don't have a, a an android device that i use every day i don't know what it is but it, you save it basically as a shortcut on your home screen when you actually subscribe and you can go back and click to it it's not the same as an app no, and it's not the same as a Google wide app. It's not like Stitcher or Spotify or anything like that. So 
Uh, but it is inherent in the search. And that's the key, because if you're looking for something, if I'm searching for something and I go in and search and I just did this, by the way, Star Wars podcast, it will pop up different Star Wars podcasts. And if you click on it, then it will actually bring up like the most recent episodes and stuff like that. And you can actually play it, see if you like it or whatever to a normal person that's not accustomed to using these apps. That's how I want to actually experience the environment. And I think they're going to bring that to Chrome eventually, but it's going to take some time because it's a completely different business line for Google. So we'll see uh, what happens there. Now it, it was a five part series and we basically gone over most of part one and a little bit of part two. Steven, what else do you want to say about part two? Well, I'm going to say that out of this whole thing, part one was the most interesting to me. I'm my opinion. I think that part five was second most interesting. And then part three and four, there wasn't a lot in there, but I will say that sprinkled through the whole thing is trails of what part two really talks about, which is the fact that they're looking to possibly change actual search algorithms and how it displays podcast data to somebody. I'll just read this big long quote because it, it does a really good job of explaining what this means in the longer term. Integrating with search means figuring out what each podcast is about and understanding the content of the podcast. This is something Google has done extremely well for text articles, as well as for images and even more structured data, such as maps. We can help with audio too. It has the potential to help people find the best content for them in that moment better than they can today. For example, it's a grave understatement to say that a lot of people are interested in the Kardashian family. If you, I'm not, no, I'm not either. Uh, if you search Chris Jenner on Google today, you probably get information about her as well as articles and videos on the web. This is great, but you'll likely miss the interview she did on Never Before with Janet Mock, where she talks candidly about parenting and some of her life before she became super famous. So it's a great example on how they're looking to maybe really mine, so to speak, that podcast data and help show it in results. So that'll be interesting to see. Um, part two, that's pretty much the big takeaway. Part three, uh, honestly, there's a lot of speculation in that, in my opinion. I think that there's a lot of information that the author is just sort of brainstorming possible futures. But uh, I will say that um, in there, one of the things that they end up saying is if Google knows you're interested in politics, we might be able to bring you the latest episode of today, ex today explained or the daily without you even having to ask for it. If you follow American sports, maybe you would like Jalen and Jake Kobe or PTI. So really, again, another example on how they're looking to match podcasts to search people searching. And also it's a result of all that data that they're aggregating <laughs> over you willfully or not. Seriously, I mean, yeah. that, that's how they know you and you log in and into whatever account it is, your Google account, and then they can track you and what your likes are. And that's how they end up actually presenting you with the it's the same way that uh, youtube search when your stuff pops up you're like oh that looks so interesting how did you know i liked it well it's because they've been tracking you for five yeah. years they can figure out how old you are and what your likes and dislikes and hey some of the people like you like this stuff you might want to check it out yeah it's the same sort of thing part, so part four is pretty interesting because what they talk about is interoperability i believe is how you how you say it i don't know it cannot be uh but that the, was pretty good for a canadian uh, absolutely the idea is that what you do is you have multiple google devices that all share the podcast so what that means is like if you start listening at home you can go pick it up uh, on your phone later or you can go over to your google home so they're really looking at this and that's really what part four breaks down is what that potential could be and i say potential because again there's lots of speculation by the author in this but it's a good example of how we might be headed for a podcast world where a lot of these devices end up essentially syncing the data, which syncing it, you know, that's not really that new to some of the podcast apps, but across all of these different platforms, so to speak, it's a great idea. If you're in the Apple architecture, that synchronization already exists. So like you said, this is nothing new, but it would be new for people that aren't completely in the Apple architecture. Like I have an iOS mobile device. I have an iPad and an iPhone, but I don't have an Apple computer. Nor do I ever want one because of a variety of different reasons. So it's impossible for me 
to sync back and forth unless I use the iTunes program and there is syncing that happens there, but it exists in iOS and it exists to a certain extent in the Google area, but maybe not completely in podcasting right now, which would be great. Now, part five, which just came out today was interesting because it talked about Google's AI doing automatic transcription of your podcast, not necessarily to give to you, but to use in their search results. So they could serve up content to somebody that it was a part of the episode just by the transcription that can actually go to the time code. And I think one of the examples was, I can't remember the celebrity, it was some football player. He went into some restaurant and he said, hey, it was great being at a restaurant. And if you're in that same town, you can ask your Google assistant, hey, what do you think about this restaurant? And instead of popping up with the normal reviews and review sites and the location with map, all of a sudden it starts playing that clip from that famous person and giving their review of it. And it is a different way to use everything, but it's all made possible through that transcript. And I think eventually those transcripts will be made available as they're modified to people. But then that brings up a whole bunch of legal issues. Bang's Naughty Bits over on Reddit brought this up is if you're talking about something, it's slander, but then if it's written, it's libel and or, or vice versa. I can't remember off the top of my head, but the point is, if you're guilty of one and then it becomes written down because it's in a transcript somewhere that you didn't authorize, but is out there because somebody else requests it, then that does that become a slander and libel? I, I don't know. I mean, there are legal legalities here that need to be ironed out and there's uh, exciting stuff with the Google transcription, but there's also a, hmm, do I really want this available or Here's the other thing. I have to say things in a specific, as our friend Cody Gaw was reminding us, I have to say things in a specific way in order for it to be really picked up by the Google SEO to be served up to somebody else. No, that makes sense. So it'll be interesting to see. Overall, I think that this five part series is worth the read. Uh, I think that it's a fair assessment to say that there's a lot of people making some pretty concrete assumptions that shouldn't be making that because we don't know. Google's pretty good about keeping things under wraps. So um, I, I think that this has to be taken with a grain of salt, but really worth taking a look at. And at the least, see if your podcast is available through this method, through your site. Uh, we will say this, that one of the things that's a downside to the way this works is that sometimes if more than one site, and I'll say a lot of times if there's more than one site that's using this code to embed the podcast, uh, there are situations where Google just picks one. So I've seen it before where there's been a search result up top that's been a website and right below has been the Apple podcast result and the integration has been on the Apple podcast page, not the actual first one, which was the uh, main website. So time will tell. I think it's a really neat article, but uh, definitely a lot of information, a lot of question marks still to, to be had. Once again, that can be found at Pacific Content, which you can get via our link, which is geeks.link slash Google Podcasts one. Then also we did a short segment last week on the new Skype for creators recording because everybody was getting all excited about what's going to happen with that. And we just want to have a little follow up with that. So what we didn't talk about during that, we did talk about having a backup of anything that you use digitally, whether it's cat. And I didn't say cast, but try cast. I did say Zencast or ringer. So we advocate for backups. Matter of fact, it's our prime recording for us on better podcasting. We use our zoom recording devices. However, if you use Skype, and you use a third party app, say it's uh, Iver or MP3 Skype recorder or whatever you use. If Skype does, in fact, put out an update to the application, it has in the past been known to break third party applications in their API. So all of a sudden you might be using Skype. If you Skype for example, is your primary recorder, you might want to start investigating some different ways to record the Skype versus your third party app because it might not connect. And I'll give you an example that's not Skype. For instance, over on YouTube, YouTube Live, there is a toolbox that you can bring out the Google to a uh, Google Live toolbox that broke about a year ago for like, I don't know, three, four months at least. And 
And, and we had to bring in third party apps like Manicam or XSplit or whatever to flip our video back and forth because if you're recording locally, it will your video would look reverse to you. So the Google Hangouts toolbox actually reversed that for us and we didn't have to worry about that. But when it broke, then we had to figure out other ways to do it. With Skype, you can get ahead of the game and you can prepare by investigating alternative methods now if you're only using your Skype recorder to record your podcast. Just to be prepared for when that might happen. We don't know for sure if it'll happen, but it might happen. For sure. So thank you very much for doing that follow up on Skype. SP, I know that you do love Skype and that it is the one thing in your life that always works all the time. So let's go ahead and move on to better pod back. All right, let's start off with a tweet from a Mike Howard, a.k.a. JPEG. Ah, he tweeted us and he said, well, crap, just realized there is no better pod tonight. Now, what am I going to do? Maybe I will take up Needlepoint. Uh, so the reason why behind this is because I mentioned earlier in the show, there's a little tease for you. We're recording this on Friday, April 27th. We usually record this on Wednesdays. You know what? Sometimes life happens. Sometimes you got to do the dad duty. And that's what I had to do on Wednesday. So, uh, yeah, blame me. Don't send your hate mail to SP. SP was ready. He was waiting to go. In fact, I didn't even tell him I wasn't going to. I just stood him up. You did. That was interesting. I was about to go live. Matter of fact, when he shut the live feed down on our shared YouTube channel. So that was, I was like, what is wrong with YouTube? That's not true, by the way. I, I We always talk. We like to talk. We talk a couple times a day. Technically, we didn't talk. We just messaged i believe is the term that the kids are using these days we texted we you know what it, it, we've heard of the term that starts with an s but this is podcast related it would be a pext i pexted text. him text. a pod text okay so mike by the way maybe you'll take up needlepoint well maybe you can needlepoint your drone a little cover for when it's cold out so it doesn't get so cold and the electronics will stay warm so you can fly longer i think that actually might be good for your drone right i, I was thinking more of a custom microphone windscreen that's what i was thinking needlepoint i think I so that, I, i'm thinking like crochet or or what, what's that other uh, I, mike will tell knit, us all knit. about yeah, okay well mike will tell us all about it because we know he's taking it up uh we also had covert nerd at the covert underscore nerd say thanks Stephen john drew and stargate pioneer for the shout out and playing of my message to johnny pennington i agree he needs his own segment keep up the good work so there you go johnny i uh, send your membership fee of 39.99 per day to podcast at betterpodcasting.com and we might make that happen 39.99 per day so that and we will consider making him his own segment once he launches his podcast. Right. And by the way, that's thirty nine ninety nine per day, not not per day that we're recording. That's per day. That's thirty nine ninety nine American. True. Yeah. Okay. And that's a, for consideration. Consideration. <laughs> Jeremy T. Dennis over at the Transmissions Podcast. He tweeted us earlier this week and says, interesting. Can't wait to hear what at better pod has to say about this. And he linked the article from Pacific content that we've been talking about for all of the uh, second half of the podcast here. And it, yeah, I hope you were satisfied in what we said. And if not, please let us know and we will cover whatever you need us to cover Jeremy, because we are here for you and you and you and you and you and you. I just pointed to all our listeners, all seven of them. Yeah, he did the whole Oprah thing. That's what he did. Uh, we also got an email from Diami Poloki, and uh, guess what this was? This was a voice clip. Should we hear it? Yeah, I want to hear this. Gentlemen, the correct pronunciation for Hopog, New York is Hopog. Wow, I, I didn't catch it the first time you said it. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't think I'll ever call it Hapaj again. Hapog. There you go. Hapog. Hapog. And 
you know, I did not say it in a slanderous ma- way. I was not trying to make fun of it. It was literally, I had never heard it before, so I was just making it up. So, Hapage is, is what I thought, but it's not. It's I legitimately, Hapage. I used to use, there's this company called Hapage, and uh, I, uh, well, Hapag now, I know it's called Hapag, but but I used to use some of their products. I always thought it was Hapage. So, there you go, Hapag. Hapag. Thank you very much. Hapag, for- New York. Yeah. Thank you, Diami. And what other email did we have here, SP? We actually had a longer email from Jeremy Dennis from the Transmissions Podcast. He says, hey, guys, on your most recent show, you were talking about trying to use NDI to send SP's video to Steven to get around using something like Skype. I've always thought that NDI was for a more local network, not for sending data across the Internet. It seems like that would introduce a number of issues that it's not built to handle, where a Skype, Google Hangouts, etc. are optimized for bad network connections. However, I am excited for the upcoming Skype creators features. I have played with NDI and XSplit a bit and hope to use it in the future to bring a better video component to my shows. New Tech, spelled N-E-W-T-E-K, has some free NDI tools available that lets you play with it, and you've promised, uh, and they've promised a big upgrade coming up sometime soon. Outside of NDI, I've got a question for you guys. I've been looking at ways to promote my show and keep coming back to ads on Overcast. Have either of you placed an ad on there? I've tried Facebook ads in the past and have had no luck. It seems like Overcast would be a better since it's already targeting someone that's looking for podcasts. Thanks. Jeremy, so two issues there. Steven, let's handle the Skype issues first. Sure. I believe uh, Skype Skype announced Microsoft said there's no Skype anymore. It's just done forever. That's that's, that's... how are we connecting right I'm, now? I'm kidding, by the way. Uh, okay. No, the NDI thing. Yeah, so absolutely. Uh, in a lot when we talked about it last time, I had actually used the term. I think I'd said that a physical cable replacement, and that's sort of what I was alluding to. Um, and I think we mentioned possible bandwidth issues with SP. Yes. As NDI stands right now, absolutely, it's meant for a local area network. It is meant as a physical cable replacement. It is highly unlikely that I'm running a physical cable from my house in wonderful British Columbia to Stargate Pioneer on the moon. It's not going to happen. So, um, you know, we're working on the space elevator, we're working on it. Yeah. So that's probably not the case. And yes, that because of that bandwidth is a concern. Now, there are a couple of companies out there that have looked to sort of harness this information and they've what they've done is they've made some ways that you can link two people together. I'm sure you would still have the bandwidth problems, but maybe not. Maybe they compress. I don't know. In any case, um, I think the way that NDI is likely going to be used with Skype is in a capacity of it takes the Skype video, the, you send the Skype video over the internet in its usual state, so probably not anything higher. This is my guess. Um, maybe better quality, but likely not. And then on the other end, what Skype will then at that do at that point is essentially convert it to NDI so that your software can use that. So really, there's probably not going to be a difference in connection between the two. That's my speculation based off of NDI being such high bandwidth, uh, such a high bandwidth service. But I don't know. I, I keep my fingers crossed that there's Skype quality improvement in some form. My concern here is the same thing with Zencaster. If your connection isn't great, if your computer isn't great and you try to record both ends and it's actually the computer at the other end that's recording their end and then it's sending it to you, you're going to run into the same issues where the recording might actually blip and not record because either the connection or the computer on the other end doesn't have the specs really to do it. And the other person, like a guest, they just they wouldn't know. So It's an issue. Now, the second part of his email was the question about ads on Overcast. I first heard about this a couple of months ago. I was thinking about doing it, but then everything happened in my personal life and I just didn't have a opportunity to enact on it. And you would have to create a promo of whatever length it is. I can't remember the lengths that they were talking about, like 15, 30 and 45 seconds or something like that, which we're going to have to talk about that in the future, how to create an actual promo spot. Steven, we're not going to talk about that today. But I would think, and this is why I was interested in it, that your assessment, Jeremy, is exactly my assessment that Facebook is just not going to be good for hobby podcasts because it's you're just not going to cut through the Facebook um, period of firewalls and um, algorithms and stuff like that. Even if you're directly targeting some people, the, the return on investment 
really isn't there. But if you're already down selecting the people that are listening to podcasts anyway, and they're geeky enough to have downloaded the Overcast app and use that, you're probably going to be targeting a subset of people that are more than likely to check out a podcast. Now, it might not be your podcast. Not everybody is interested in the Transformers, Jeremy. I don't know why. I, I blame Michael Bay personally, because... <laughs> Without Michael Bay, everybody's interested in the Transformers. I mean, everybody's heard of Optimus Prime, right? But it might work best for another podcast, but you still might be able to get some listeners because not, maybe not everybody's heard about the Transmissions podcast. Say it's somebody that's coming out of college and for the first time they're commuting for work and they're they're listening to Radio Lab One or their favorite NFL podcast or whatever. If you pop in your transmissions podcast promo, they're all of a sudden go, oh wow, there's podcasts about Transformers. I am so into that. Boom, you got yourself a new listener. Yeah. So uh we look forward to hearing the ad that you have and how you talk about Optimus Prime shipping. Finally, oh, you like Optimus Prime. I, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, finally, let's talk a little bit about my feedback, which is the high LPR 781. Uh, if you missed that episode for the last about month or so, I've been using the high PR 781 microphone. It is a dynamic microphone for, uh, podcasters, no elite transceivers and podcasters is what it says. Uh, this is a microphone that SP, you know, a little bit about the backstory. It's sub 200, right? Yeah, I believe at the time of purchase, this was around 180 US dollars. Yeah, and what's interesting about it is because it is a large dynamic or large diaphragm dynamic microphone. And I wanted to give this a bit of a try to see what it was like, because it's different from a lot of other microphones in this class where it's actually shorter and it's also um, meant for being used with uh, ham radios. So very odd to couple that with, with podcasting, but they did. So after using it for a while and tinkering with my DBX286 and other things, uh, I am ready to call this microphone. And I'm gonna say, it's not a bad microphone. I'm pretty impressed with the clarity that I get with it. And that is easily the biggest plus with this is the clarity. The clarity in the upper end is amazing compared to many other microphones that I've used. Now, the reason that I suspect that is, is because if you think about it, if you're using a ham radio uh, with connection problems, what do you want? You want clarity. And so when there's signal degradation, whatnot, having that higher upper end, that clear upper end is going to help make sure your message comes through. This microphone easily is the most upper end heavy microphone that I've used. And it's just evident by the way that I eventually settled with my enhancer on the DBX-286. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, you got two knobs on the DBX-286. You can increase the lower range and you can increase the upper range. This microphone is the only one that I've basically had to nearly crank the lower range and turn down all, almost all the way the upper range because without it, it didn't match well for my voice, in my opinion, when it was just standard. And also, compared to my wonderful co-host here, Stargate Pioneer, it stood out like a sore thumb because I, I got to balance my sound a little bit to all of what people are used to as well as who I'm podcasting with or it can sound really, really different. So it is definitely very upper end heavy, but with some enhancement of some form, you can get it to be a little bit more even of a signal. I'll say from a gain perspective, this microphone falls more in line with like the BP40 um, compared to a lot of the microphones I've tried. The BP40 tends to run needing a little less gain than a lot of the other ones that I've used. Uh, this is right around the same amount of gain. And uh, one really neat thing that I discovered is there's a real lack of proximity effect on this microphone. Uh, we actually had some people comment before offline that they've noticed since I started using this microphone, I can move all over the place. I can I can move in my seat a little bit more and you don't really notice it in the audio. So it does a pretty good pickup. And when I do get closer, yes, it gets a little bassier, but not as much as many other microphones do. And from a video perspective, uh, the shorter profile is kind of nice because it's less microphone in my face. So from a video perspective, it's nice. With that said, um, my personal opinion, I like the Procaster a little bit better. I think it's better out of the box. And that's sort of the tests that I like to do here is out of the box using a reasonable preamp 
what microphone, how do I feel about the microphone? And I think out of the box with the Procaster, you get a little bit more even sound. And especially if you're in a situation that you weren't able to have a DBX 286 in order to enhance it, you'd have to go in and do a lot more EQ, in my opinion, on the PR781 than you would on the Rode Procaster. And the Rode Procaster, it's about the same price, right, SP? Right. So if you go to camelcamelcamel.com, you will bring up and you search for the PR781 and the Rode Procaster, it will bring up the cost profiles ever since it came on the store. So you can see the high amount of price and the low amount of price. So we won't talk about the high. We'll talk about the low. The lowest the PR781 has been brand new on Amazon.com in the US was $159. The Rode Procaster brand new from amazon.com which i believe they're not necessarily a road authorized reseller so you might want to get it from somebody else who is i, I believe b and h is anyway on camel 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 the lowest price is 189 dollars. so you're talking about a 30 dollar price difference between the two and if you can get the road procaster versus the Heil PR781 for that additional $30. And sometimes for a hobby podcaster, that $30 makes a difference. But if you can, I would recommend going with the Rode Procaster. That said, my voice is deeper than Steven's. My voice sounds better on the Electro Voice RE320 than Steven's does because of its uh, high-end clarity. So I think my voice might be a better fit for the PR781 than Stevens. So we'll have to do that test sometime. So next time it goes on sale, I'll look at grabbing it and then testing it for a couple of weeks on better podcasting. So you can get an idea of a deeper voice. With that said, if you are podcasting in a noisy environment, it might be a good idea to use something that's more like the PR781, like a bowling alley. I don't know why you would podcast in a bowling alley, but let's just say you are. It might be better to use the Pile PR781. It's better than bowling the podcast. That's what it is. Better bowling. I got to look up that domain to make sure we score that. <laughs> uh, I will say this, that um, I am pretty happy with the clarity in a different sense from a podcast week to week sense uh i think that i'm probably not going to keep using it long term but i've mentioned this before on the show in my day job i do electronic modules for the company that i work for and yes i use my own gear because it's better than what they would provide and you know i know my gear so i, I do it at my home yes i do that uh, I was reviewing, I did a module with this microphone and I was comparing that and then I went back and I had to look at something on an old one. And when you're listening on a crummy work corporate computer with crummy corporate provided headphones, uh, I was really happy with how I sounded on the PR781 because again, that whole clarity thing with the signal degradation, uh, it was pretty impressive to me how how much clearer I came through. So it's not bad in a situation like that, but I just think from a week to week perspective on the podcast, I think there's better options out there, but if you can get a good sale on it. It's not a bad microphone by any means. Um, the only thing that I'm not sure about is if there's a possible way to get a shock mount for it. I think it does operate the same way as the PR40. So if there's a way to shock mount the PR40, which I believe there is, then you should be able to, I think, shock mount this, but yeah, it was a worthwhile test. And, um, I will, I will say there's microphones that I've tested that I won't ever probably touch again. Uh, this one here, I could see myself digging it out occasionally. And there was a moment that I actually considered continuing using this long term, just using some post-production EQ. But uh, I like to keep the live experience good, too. I knew you wouldn't be able to steer away from your Audio Technica BP40 for long. By the way, betterbowlingpodcast.com is available, as is betterbowlingpodcast.shop for four ninety nine, better bowling podcast dot global for fourteen ninety nine, and better bowling podcast dot online for four ninety nine. Awesome. And finally, before we get off of this point here, we will say this that we had a tweet from Josh Liston that said that latest Heil is actually my favorite microphone on at Steven John Drew thus far. A little plosive maybe, but suits the man's voice. And then I asked for a little bit of information on why Josh said that, and Josh had said that it has a natural sound for a Heil, not PR40 boom and sizzle. I feel like it's a good balance between broadcast enhancement brackets like the bp40 and natural voicing 
brackets the procaster note i'm hearing the produce podcast mostly in particular i like the smoother top end so everybody's different and uh, every voice is different and that's why we always say get the microphone that you like best indeed which is why i'm back on the electro voice re320 yeah i i did enjoy the road procaster it was just a little bit too plosively for me so i'm back on the electro voice re320 i'll try another microphone again soon we just get maybe you know I do have that Audio Technica BP40. Maybe I should give that another go. Perhaps. But on that bombshell, there you go. I stole Clarkson's line. Uh, for episode 128 of Better Podcasting, I'm Stephen John Drew saying another podcast is complete, another microphone test is complete, and my life is complete knowing Stargate Pioneer. And I am SP saying if you are looking for a needle-pointed drone cover, go to jpeg to raw bye thank you for listening to another episode of better podcasting we want to hear from you you can find all of our contact information at betterpodcasting.com if you like the show please consider giving us a five-star review in itunes we encourage you to check out all of the other geeky podcasts available at gunnageeknetwork.com. This has been a Gunna Geek production. Thanks for listening, and we will see you again next week.